nice to see you. It's great that we can gather again together as a church family and celebrate God's goodness to us, uh, sing to Him and about Him, we hear from the Bible, and we've got a cracker of the passage today in sure. John chapter 3, where Jesus, well, he has a bit of an interesting conversation with a dude called Nicodemus, but to whet our appetite for, mm. you know, where James might be going when he speaks on that passage later, I've got a question for you. All right, all right. Okay. Have you recently had a life-altering experience? I have. I went skydiving about a year ago. Okay. Sounds, um, sounds thrilling. Do tell. For many who have done it, they've had a, an exhilarating experience and they've been smiling. Mine was very traumatic and quite terrifying. Mm, I think we're seeing a little bit of that right now. Might have some footage. <laughs> uh, and I'm, um, I'm, I'm laughing with you. But that's fine. You can you can laugh at me too. It's, mm. As you can see, it's quite funny. Um, you can all laugh at my horror. But it was uh, not exhilarating or transformative in the slightest. Okay. Or other than, I think it just asserted that I am very comfortable in my comfort zone and being comfortable. Okay, so not transformative, really. <clears throat> no. Okay. Well, that's that's. A good illustration of what the passage today is not about. Right. Yeah, yeah. Which is more about the transformative power of Jesus. When he speaks about a very popular phrase that uh, I'm sure that a lot of Christians hear uh, quite a bit, being born again. Mm. So we'll get to that later on. But thanks for sharing. Pleasure. Mm. You want to enjoy? No. <laughs> Click. Yeah. Like and subscribe. <laughs> We're going to continue our time together like we normally do. Uh, by singing. So I'm going to hand it over to the music team to lead us in song. Thanks, guys. Let's talk to God. 
Almighty God and gracious Heavenly Father, your perfections are matchless and without comparison. You are eternal and unchanging in your character. You are everywhere. Your knowledge is perfect. Your wisdom is perfect and unsearchable. Your power is absolute, irresistible and sovereign. You are unspotted in moral purity, beauty and holiness, and your justice is unstoppable. You will put all things right. All praise to you. And in your perfect judgment, you have perfectly satisfied what is justly due to our sin and in the merciful sacrifice of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus, you have saved us. For this we thank and we praise you, that we know you and can rightly adore you, free of any sin or weakness that would separate us from you. In the light of your perfections displayed and lovingly made known to us in Jesus, we confess our sins to you, not in fear of your punishment, but so that we might treasure your forgiveness afresh and train our hearts not to grieve you so when we can please you instead by your Spirit. As such, we confess uh, any inordinate and immoderate setting of our mind, our will or our affections upon other things and taking them off from you in whole or in part. We're sorry for our vanity, for our unbelief, for our distrust, despair and unrepentance. We beg your forgiveness for any hardness of heart towards you, for any pride and any presumption. We're sorry for being lukewarm towards you, for slighting or ignoring your commands, for resisting and grieving your spirit. Grant us a greater love of your love towards us in Jesus, that we might abandon the worship of anything else or anyone else over and above you. Train our hearts to worship you alone and to adore you as is your due and for our good. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a few announcements for us uh, today. Firstly, we're really glad that you can be joining us this morning, uh, particularly those who would love to be at church in person but uh, just can't at the moment. Uh, we love you and uh, we're really glad that you can still enjoy doing church with us uh, in this way online. So that's our first announcement. Uh, secondly, we want to celebrate Christmas together as a church family this year. Uh, this year, uh, of course, we need to be COVID safe. So the plan for Christmas Day is to have one church service for everyone at 9am. Uh, we'll be gathering together both in person and online with a live stream. Uh, this is so everyone can join in to celebrate together at the same time. Because of social distancing requirements, the in-person option is it's best suited to adults and youth, and so we're encouraging families with young kids who find it difficult staying in their seats to take up the online option this year. Uh, we're planning on having something special for the kids to watch online at around 8.30 Christmas Day in the morning, and this will be followed by the live stream of the Christmas service. We've got a, a 110 person limit on the church space, so to attend in person, uh, you'll need to register uh, online uh, to attend, and you can do that via our website. So, adults and youth, please register online, and families, mark it in your diaries and plan to tune in from 8.30 on Christmas morning. If you've got any questions or concerns, please get in touch with me, more than happy to chat about it, and we look forward to celebrating Christmas with you this year. And our final announcement uh, is that the Australian Presbyterian World Mission arm um, of the Presby Church supports a number of missionaries and missionary activities, which we're going to hear a little bit about now. Uh, one of those missionaries is Rob and L Falls, who are preparing to serve in Vanuatu next year, and who we as a local church are looking to support more directly next year. So let's take a look at that video now. take a few minutes to tell you just a fraction of what God is doing in the world today to honour his great name. Uh, first of all, partnership in Vanuatu. In April this year, Cyclone Harold hit northern Vanuatu and caused extensive damage to the Talua Theological Training Institute. And so we launched an appeal. And through that and some other money we were given, we are able now to send $122,000. That won't repair all of the damage but it will enable Talua to open, we hope, in April next year. 
We think that the one thing that the PCA can do to help Vanuatu is for the provision of training resources, both in, in buildings and people. And so, for example, we have a terrific partnership with this couple, Tom and Margaret Richards, from the Westminster Presbyterian Church. Uh, they're a quality couple, and we work closely with them as they serve at Talua and as they live in one of the houses that APWA maintains. In late 2019, John and Kara Decker finished at Tailua. Uh, we're hoping to send Rob and L Falls to replace them in 2021, uh, with Rob lecturing in theology. Uh, but with the closure of the Australian and the Vanuatu borders, that's looking quite difficult. Uh, again, Rob and L are a quality couple, and we're very grateful to God uh, for raising them up. Like so many other first-time missionaries, they're currently in Australia seeking to raise partnership support so that they can travel to Vanuatu as soon as the borders open. If your congregation is looking for someone to support, then Rob and Elle will be a great investment. Well, that's some pretty encouraging stuff. We're now going to have a special spot for our kids. So I'll hand it over to the Kids Spot team. Thanks, guys. Shaz! You're back! How was the holiday? Oh, hi, James. Oh, my holiday was fantabulous. Oh, there was sun and pools and beaches and yummy drinks and, oh, the old Shazza is gone. All those anger issues gone. I'm not even mad about that haircut. Oh, I feel uh, like a new person. Good, great, thanks, I uh, think. Uh, but look, you look like a new person. It looks like the holiday's been transformative. Oh, it's been a real transformation, James. You know what I think it was? Yeah, what? There was this spa treatment, and oh, they, they did this nice little massaging thing on my face, and there was some yummy smelling oils, and oh, I came up with skin soft as baby skin, and I feel like I've been born again. That's awesome, that is so good. So, so you ready to get back to work? Why did you have to remind me, James? Oh, I, I can already feel my shoulders getting tight. Oh. I'm sorry, it's just, you know, because you had a Thanks break. A in, uh, You're bursting my holiday bubble here. Uh, so you don't, you don't think you'll still feel like a new person after a week at work? Not if Baz is there. Yeah, no, that, that guy can be tough. Yeah. Well, look, I, I do have some good news for you, though. Yeah, what's that? You already have been born again. What are you talking about? Well, you believe in Jesus, right? Yeah. And you're part of God's kingdom. Hmm. Yeah, so Jesus tells us that in order to be part of God's kingdom, we have to be born again. All right, I'm going to take a wild stab here and just assume you're not talking about Shazza becoming a baby again. No, 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 no nothing like that. In fact, uh, there was this dude back in Jesus' time, Nicodemus, and he thought something similar, that that sounded a bit weird. That's but what no, it sounds like. No, no, so what Jesus meant was is that just like we've been born physically, we need to be born again spiritually as well. That's how we understand God and his kingdom and all that sort of stuff. All right. I like the sound of that. Yeah. And... and it sounds kind of familiar because you've been talking to me a lot about, you know, God and how much he loves us and, and what he's done for us in Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, you know, in John 3.16, that's part of this passage that we're going to be looking at in church this week. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. It, it's all this whole summary that John gives us of the gospel and the good news and everything that Jesus has done for us. So when we're born again by God's Spirit, we believe in him and then he gives us eternal life. It's pretty great, right? Yeah, that is, look, it, it's pretty awesome. I'm not going to lie. But what else happens when we're born again? Because it sounds like there's something else just, besides eternal life. Just in case eternal life's not enough for you? Just Yeah, well, I, I kind like something now yeah no fair enough okay look, well, look what it does is it means that we're with jesus now he's the source of all life and we've got him and it also means that we walk in the truth and we can obey him and live for him and it means that we can come into the light to let everybody else see the good stuff that god has done in us you know, it does sound a little bit better than the spa treatment. And that maybe after a week of work, you can still keep hoping and rejoicing in all this good stuff God's given you in Jesus? Yeah. Yeah, look, that that's true. And 
Tell you, you're lucky that you had some good news for me, James, because if you didn't, you'd be in hot water, that's all I can say. Just another reason to be thankful for mm-hmm. the gospel. Yeah. So, yeah, good news, right? Yeah. You know what? We should really be telling more people about this. We should. It's the best. It's free, right? Absolutely. Just because God loves us. It's a gift. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hey, hey, buddy. Hey, have you heard about the guy, Jesus? Quick, I'll tell you all about him. Go get him, Jazz. Go get him.
Thanks, guys. In a moment, Meg is going to be joining us and leading us through prayer, and then Malachi is going to read to us from this passage in John 3 today. Then James will be back and talking to us about the transformative power of Jesus. So right now, over to you, Meg. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for bringing us together for another Sunday. Thank you that it is your promise of forgiveness, grace, and hope that brings us together. Thank you that because you so loved this world, you sent your one and only son to die, that we might have eternal life with you. We thank and praise you that nothing can separate us from your abounding love, and we pray that we will always take comfort in this truth. Lord, we thank you so much for the various ministries that people are involved in throughout our church. Thank you for the gifts that you have blessed us with, and we pray that we will continue to use them to glorify you. We thank you for the leadership teams in each of these ministries. We pray that you will continue to sustain them as the year comes to a close, giving them energy and an eagerness to teach people about you. We also pray, God, that the people hearing about you might come to accept you as their Lord and Saviour through your never-ending grace. Lord, we pray for all the people in our church who have finished up school, study, or who might be going through a period of change at this time. We pray that as they look to the future, they will come to you for guidance and wisdom as to what you have planned for them. We ask they will feel a sense of ease in their decisions and will rely on you, their true hope and foundation. We pray that the people around them will also support and love them during this transition. We pray that wherever they might find themselves, there will be a shining light in the darkness, pointing the people around them to you. We thank you, God, that the COVID-19 situation in Australia is slowly getting better. Thank you for our government, healthcare and other frontline workers, as well as the many volunteers who have worked tirelessly to help our communities. We pray that this virus will continue to disappear both here in Australia and around the world. We pray for the people creating vaccinations, that they will do so wisely and safely. We also pray that our government bodies will listen to advice from healthcare professionals as to how best to combat the distribution of vaccines and the lowering of COVID cases. We pray for the people who have been isolated because of this virus or other things that may be happening. We pray, God, over this time, they might come to know you more, trusting in your plan for them. We pray that you will be with their families and friends. Help them to support, care and love these people, even from a distance. Give them courage and an eagerness as they await to be, to, for a day that they will be united with them. Lord, we thank you for Matt, James, the elders and other people involved in leadership at GPC. Thank you for their commitment to you and seeing your word spread throughout the coast. We pray as the year comes to a close, you will continue to sustain them. Please give them energy, creativity and wisdom as to how best to serve you. We thank you for the ways that they have been able to keep us safe this year with COVID-19. And we pray as they start to consider how things will play out next year, they will look to you for guidance. We also pray that they will have times to rest when they need it. We also lift up their families and friends and pray that they will have the energy and willingness to support and care for them even during these tough times. Lord, thank you for all that we have been learning in the book of John. And please help us now as we read and learn from chapter 3 to have our hearts and minds open to what you have to say. We pray all of this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish Royal Council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are, te you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not, him, not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? The leaders asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to the spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is, this, it, so it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be? The commuters asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things 
and you do not believe, how then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God, in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light, and will not come into the light for fear of their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, that it may be seen plainly, and that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Hi, everyone. One of my kids' favorite book series is called The Bad Guys by Aaron Blaby. The story is about Mr. Wolf, Mr. Snake, Mr. Piranha, and Mr. Shark. Four predators who decide they don't want to be bad guys anymore, and they want to turn good. Unfortunately, they are not the best at this, and judging by the giggling coming from my boys as they read, hilarity ensues. This idea of people switching from the dark side to the side of good and light is hardly just kid stuff. It's one of the most basic themes in stories generally. In his 2004 book, The Seven Basic Plots, Why We Tell Stories, Christopher Booker lists the seven basic plot categories that all stories fall into. They are overcoming the monster, rags to riches, the quest, voyage and return, comedy, tragedy, and rebirth. Now, a rebirth plot centers around an unlikable or even genuinely evil person who undergoes a transformation and becomes good. They are reborn from the darkness into the light. Some of our most iconic and popular stories fit this mold, whether it's Darth Vader in Star Wars, Edmund in The Lion, The Witch in the Wardrobe, or Ebenezer Scrooge in A Christmas Carol. When you start looking at books, movies, and TV, the list goes on and on. The thing is, though, is that sometimes the morality of these turns from bad to good is a little tough to figure out. Let me give you an example. During this COVID season, Fee and I went back and started watching The Vampire Diaries. I was always a Buffy guy, so I was skeptical when the show first came out, but it's been super fun to get into 10 years later. The show's first few seasons centers around a love triangle between two vampire brothers and a human girl. The brothers are trying to be good to differing degrees, Stefan more than Damon, but because they are, you know, vampires, they both go on some rather dark trips with innocent folk or minor reoccurring characters dying at their hands. One of the brothers is going through an extended dark streak at the moment, and even though I know that he's going to come back to the light, I also feel like it's going to be tough to forget about the dozens of people that he's currently murdering along the way. We always need something to excuse the bad guy's behavior if we're really going to feel it, or they need to do something good to make up for the bad, or they need to still face the consequences of their actions. Now in this passage today, we're going to hear how Jesus teaches that if anyone is to enter into, the, into God's kingdom, they need to be reborn. But it's not just the bad guys who need to be born again, it's all of us. So let's get to it. We're going to look at this passage in three sections. First, uh, we'll look at Jesus' conversation with a guy called Nicodemus. Then we'll look at John's comments that follow on from that conversation. Then we'll think about what it means for us if we are not believing in Jesus right now and what it means for us for those who are. So as we begin, a quick reminder that this is John's Gospel, written somewhere between 90 to 100 AD and written about 20 years after the other Gospels. So far, in chapters 1 and 2, we've heard some amazing things about Jesus and seen him perform one miracle so far, and that he's starting to attract some attention from the religious leaders of his time. This passage in chapter 3 begins with a man named Nicodemus coming to Jesus at night, probably to try and have a longer conversation with him about what he had been teaching. Nicodemus was a member of a group called the Pharisees, guys that were big on following Old Testament law and also a bunch of later laws designed to make sure that you really followed the Old Testament law. He was also a member of the Jewish ruling council, who were the supreme authority on religious, political, and legal matters amongst the Jewish people at the time. So he's a learned and important guy. 
And he comes to Jesus, not with hostile intentions, but to try and find out more about what Jesus is teaching. So he says, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you were doing if God were not with him. And Jesus just throws a curveball at him right from the start. He says, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Now Nicodemus has come perceiving rightly that Jesus is from God, but Jesus immediately challenges him with a deep truth that he has come to reveal to the world. Nobody can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Nicodemus is understandably confused by this, and so he replies with probably what is meant to be some sort of humorous incredulity. He says, How can a man be born when he is old? Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. But Jesus is serious, and he's going to explain to Nicodemus what he is talking about. So he says, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Now when we put Jesus' two sentences next to each other, we can see that Jesus is essentially saying that being born again means being born of water and the Spirit. You can see how the two sentences uh, match up and that being born of water and spirit is the same as being born again. So the question is, what does it mean to be born of water and spirit or to be born again? Now scholars disagree over the specifics of this a bit, but what is really clear is that you need not just a physical birth to enter into the kingdom of God, but a spiritual birth too. It might be that the reference to water here is a reference to John's baptism that we've seen earlier in this gospel. And John's baptism was all about repentance and cleansing of sin. So Jesus might be saying that repentance is part of entering into the kingdom here. Even if he isn't though, we get that idea from other parts of the Bible. But what Jesus is definitely saying is that we need to be reborn or born again by a spiritual birth. He goes on, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. So we can see here, he is drawing the distinction between a physical birth done by the flesh and a spiritual birth, which is a work of the Spirit. He knows this is going to be a new idea for Nicodemus. So he says, don't be surprised, and then uses an analogy to try and explain what it's like. He essentially says that the way that, spirit, that the, the spirit moves is like the wind. We can see it moving, but we don't know where it's coming or going. So we really shouldn't be too surprised when the spirit does something we don't expect. It's kind of like the wind like that. Now at this point, Nicodemus, the learned and respected man who had come to Jesus with the sincere hope of knowing more about what Jesus was talking about, is just like, in the words of one of my growth group members, say, what? Or, in Bible talk, how can this be? Jesus knows this is a lot for Nicodemus to take in, but he doesn't miss a chance to give a gentle rebuke to Nicodemus and says, you are Israel's teacher, and do you not understand these things? His point is that someone of Nicodemus's standing should be able to understand these things, and yet is without understanding. Nicodemus was a religious and legal expert. Surely he would know how this stuff works. But as Jesus has shown, no one outside the kingdom of God understands these things unless they are born again. If the people in Jesus' time couldn't trust the Pharisees and religious experts to have the answers, then who could they turn to? Well, Jesus now puts his own testimony, and possibly the testimony of God the Father and God the Spirit, forward as the one that you can trust. He says in verse 11, I tell you the truth, we spoke of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Jesus is saying, that if Nicodemus doesn't understand what needs to happen in the lives of people here on earth, then how can Jesus speak to him about the heavenly plans that he has come to fulfill? There is only one person who understands these heavenly things, and that is the one who has gone into heaven himself, the Son of Man. 
Now, the Son of Man title, as Matt explained to us a couple of weeks ago, is Jesus' own favorite way to describe himself. The Son of Man is the divine figure from Daniel chapter 7 in the Old Testament, who comes riding on the clouds of heaven and who is worshipped by all peoples and nations. The Son of Man understands the heavenly things that God has intended, and now, even though Jesus knows Nicodemus can't understand them yet, he still hints at what these plans are. He says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Now, this is the second time in John's Gospel that Jesus has hinted at his eventual death, and we're only in chapter 3. The first was in the last chapter, when he spoke about how the the temple of his body would be destroyed and raised up in three days. Now, he speaks about the manner of his death. In the Old Testament, in Numbers chapter 21, there is a story of how God's people complained against him and Moses, and so God sent venomous snakes amongst them, and they bit the people and many died. But when the people came to Moses and confessed their sin, Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole, and everyone who looked at it lived. It's one of those stories which if you don't believe in God and you pick up a Bible, it makes you go, this stuff sounds nuts. And if you do believe in God, you've just got to be willing to say, yep, I believe it. I know how it sounds, but yes, yes, I believe that happened. Anyway, Jesus references that story and how the bronze snake was lifted up and led to people living to hint at how he is going to be lifted up, not on a pole, but on a cross. And that people would come to life through this, not by sight, but by faith. Now, this leads us to an interesting point in the next section uh, in the sermon this morning uh, that we have to pause at just briefly. If you have a red letter version of the Bible, the kind where it prints the words of Jesus in red, then depending on the version you have, the red writing will either stop here at verse 15 or it will continue on all the way down to verse 21. The reason for this is that Bible scholars and translators aren't sure if Jesus' speech goes down to verse 21 or if at verse 16 here, John, the author of the gospel, starts to make some comments of his own and reflect on what he knows about what God has done based on what Jesus just said. It's up for grabs because there aren't any speech marks in biblical Greek. So I must admit, I'm leaning uh, towards it being John's comments. I'm not going to go through it all to explain why, but it's mainly because he seems to be speaking about the death of Jesus having already happened when he says God gave his one and only son. And what that means is that what John is doing here is explaining what Jesus meant when he said that the Son of Man must be lifted up and that all who believe in him will have eternal life. So, in verse 16, John is picking up on what Jesus said in verses 14 and 15, and then explaining how it is that the Son of Man being lifted up will lead to people having eternal life. So he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Jesus has explained to Nicodemus that he and all people need to be born again by the Spirit to enter into God's kingdom, and that through faith in the Son of Man, people will receive eternal life. John, looking back from the vantage point of knowing everything that Jesus has done through his death and resurrection, gives his readers here a fuller explanation about what Jesus is hinting at with Nicodemus. In these famous verses, John makes it crystal clear that God sent his son to save the world and not to condemn it, but that it is through faith that people experience the salvation that God's son came to achieve. If we do not believe in Jesus, then we are condemned, not just for the things that we've done wrong, but also for our rejection of Jesus himself. He is really strongly putting forward the idea here that you fall into one of two camps. Either you are with Jesus and receive the life he is offering, or you are rejecting him and you stand condemned. He says from verse 19, This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. But men loved darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light, and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. Either you love light, or you love darkness. 
If you walk in the truth or you walk in shadows, you are either a bad guy or a good guy. But we have to understand what bad guys and good guys really mean here from God's perspective and how we are transformed from one to the other. Remember, Jesus started by explaining to Nicodemus that everyone needs to be born again. All of us. Not even a devout and religious and sincere guy like Nicodemus can enter the kingdom of God without being born again. Why is that? Well, in the bigger picture of the Bible, it's because all of us have been born into darkness and all of us have done evil things that deserve God's judgment. If you don't believe me, uh, let me ask, how comfortable would any of us be if we could put a TV screen on top of our head that shows our thoughts and memories of the worst things that we have done? What we do when no one is around, or the true thoughts and desires of our heart that we don't tell anyone about. How many of us would want those things to be brought into the light? And the thing is, even though we do lots of good things as people in this world, none of those things get rid of the bad. It's not a point system where if I do enough good, then I can overcome the bad. Does Stefan the vampire saving 50 people make up for the 48 that he has killed? No, right? The people that he killed and the families he hurt have still lost or cannot be given back. Uh, the things that I've done in my life that I regret, I cannot undo even if I do a thousand good deeds. But that is why the Son of Man was lifted up. That's what it means that God gave his only son, Jesus, to, to take our place and that he is condemned for us so that we can have life and life eternal. But some people choose to stay in the darkness. Some people choose to hate the light and love the darkness. Why? So that our evil deeds will not be exposed. Coming to the light means admitting that we have done wrong. It means admitting we need God's spirit to change us because we cannot change ourselves. It means recognizing that we cannot go from being bad guys to good guys on our own effort. Listen again to how John finishes this passage. He says from verse 21, but whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. A person who lives in the truth is to come into the light, so people can see the good that he or she has done. And here is the key part, that those good deeds have been done through God. We don't go from being bad guys to good guys because of what we have done. It is something that God does in us. This is good news because it means that no matter how bad you are or how bad you have been, if it is God that transforms us, there is hope because God always achieves his plans and purposes. So what does this mean for us today? Well, if you are not currently believing in Jesus, then this is your opportunity to come to him in faith and receive the gift of eternal life. Maybe you have been nowhere near the kingdom of God and you've been hiding in the shadows, terrified that your evil deeds will be exposed. Or maybe you've been like Nicodemus and thinking that because you know some stuff or have been around God's people, that somehow you are good with God by default. Either way, it is my hope and prayer that it will be crystal clear after hearing from God's word today that you need to be born again, that you need to be reborn that you need the Spirit of God to work in you and give you new life, and that today is your chance to come to Christ in faith and be given eternal life. And if that is you, then I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me now. Dear God, please forgive me for my evil deeds. Please may I be born again. Please may you give me your Spirit and save me from my sins. I believe and confess my faith in you, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, if you've just prayed that prayer sincerely and by the work of the Spirit, then you have just been born again. You have come into God's kingdom. Welcome. Please, please, please get in touch with us at the church office through our website, and we will come alongside you and help you figure out where we go from here. This is the greatest day that you will ever know. If you are currently trusting in Jesus, firstly, I hope you have been encouraged again to hear about the good news of the gospel and all that Jesus has done for us in giving those who believe in him a new life. But as we rejoice in the gift of Jesus Christ and eternal life, 
don't miss what John says about what we who walk in the truth are to do. We are to walk in the light. Not so that our good deeds can be seen for our own sake, but so that it may be plain to see that the good that we do has been done by God. We are not to be boastful about the good that we do as we follow God, but we are meant to be in the light. We are to live open lives of love for God and others, so that when someone says, there is something different about you, we can say sincerely and honestly that it is because I've been born again. I know it sounds crazy to actually just say that to someone, but we've got to own it. Because to, to deny it is to be ashamed and embarrassed about what God has done. We need to be willing to be seen as different from the world around us. And we need to be at peace with the idea that the world cannot understand why we do what we do. And even understand what we are talking about because they have not yet been born again. But just like Jesus, who led a life that meant that a sincere seeker like Nicodemus came to him looking for answers, so too we need to live lives where our conduct can be seen in order that those in the darkness can ask about the light and we can tell them about what God has done. This applies to us whether we're at work, whether at home, whether we're at school, whatever context we find ourselves in, we can tell people how God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And if we live lives, allowing the spirit to work in us more and more, being more and more like Jesus, living lives that are open, not boastful or showing off, but inviting people to come and hear the good news, then we will have rich and abundant opportunities to tell a world that knows less and less about Jesus, all about him and all that he has done. So I'm going to pray now. I'm going to pray for any who are watching, who are still yet to confess faith in Jesus, that you would because we believe this is true and we believe this is the key to eternal life and the key to your own joy. And I'm going to pray for those of us who believe in Jesus that we would live open lives of love so that we can bring people towards the light and tell them about all that Jesus has done. Let's pray together. Father God, we bring before you now anybody watching who is not currently trusting in you. And we pray, Lord, that you would make them born again, that you would birth them again, by the power of your spirit, that you would give them new spiritual life, that they would come to you in repentance, asking for forgiveness for their sins, but believing and trusting in you, Jesus Christ, as their Lord and Savior. And we pray, Lord, that they would be given the gift of eternal life, that they might be with us in heaven, and that we might all rejoice as being part of God's kingdom. And we pray, Father, for all of us who are confessing faith in you, for all of us who are walking in the truth, we pray, Father, that we would be willing to walk the truth in the light in order that others might see the lives that we are living and that they might want to know more about what it is that has worked this transformation in us. That would want, they'd want to know why we're different from the rest of the world. They'd want to know why we say uh, weird terms sometimes and talk about things in a way that they just don't understand or get. We pray, Father, you'd bring people to us like Nicodemus, seeking, sincerely wanting to know more about God, but just lacking in understanding. And we pray, Father, that as we live well and we proclaim the truth faithfully, just like John does in this gospel, that many people would come to faith in you, that they would walk in the light, they would walk in truth, and they would know you in eternity and rejoice with us all in the good that you have done. And we thank you for this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen, church. I'll see you soon. Thanks, James. Super encouraging, as always. Um, and look, one of the great opportunities that we have here at church is to worship and glorify God through song. So Fee and Dave are going to lead us in that now as we sing Come Praise and Glorify.
Well, thank you for being with us uh, as we've done church together, as we've sung about God and to him, as we've heard uh, his word and had it explained and talked to him in prayer. It's been great. And thank you for everybody uh, contributing. Thanks, Sarah, for uh, sharing. Thanks for, for having me. Thanks for having me. Thank you to all the musicians and thanks to everyone that is a part of these online services each and every week. We, uh, we see you and we really value your contributions. So thank you. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. And... Uh, Look forward to seeing you again next week. All right, see you then. Take care. Bye.